Hello everyone, welcome back from lunch. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch and I'm 100% sure you will enjoy our next speaker. He is former Congressman Joseph J. Bugroyde. He's the first certified public accountant ever elected to the United States House or Senate. And uh, he wrote a book when he was in Congressman, Unaccountable Congress, it doesn't add up. And he tells you the real numbers about our national debt and our uh, country's economy. Uh, we're from New York, Joe Bugroyde is also from New York, and uh, he really helps out college Republicans throughout the state, throughout the country, but especially those in New York. I can firsthand tell you how hard he worked to help us fund the first political club in, our, in uh, the school that I went to, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, which is in the heart of New York City, and uh, pretty much we count all the Republicans in one hand, and he helped us uh, really fight the establishment that did not want us to have a Republican club on campus. We uh, established John Jay College Republican Club all because of Joe Bugatti. He really helped us from day one and he continues to do so and never asked for anything in return. And as a uh, hard work that he gave us, we were able to host the New York State uh, College Republican Convention this year. So as a new club in, in the fourth year, we were able to host the biggest event of College Republican in the state. And that's all through Joe Bugatti. You might have heard of him, uh, he ran last year for the U.S. Senate in New York. He won the three-way primary, in the Republican primary, and he challenged Kirsten Gillibrand for U.S. Senate. Unfortunately, New York is way too blue, and Gillibrand had a lot of money in her pocket to uh, run her campaign. So we didn't win the election, but we definitely uh, had our message out there. And uh, the exciting news now, uh, also he's the father of former American Idol judge Carol Diogwadi, who will be uh, on Broadway soon. So without further ado, I want to, to introduce Joe Diogwadi, and by the way, all those books he gives to students for free. He never charges us for any of those books. He goes campus to campus, making sure that the students know the real numbers with the economy. So everybody, please welcome uh, our hero from New York. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. Thank you for being here. What you probably don't know is Marco Kepi comes from, is it Kosovo or Albania? Albania. Albania. We have a lot of ethnic Albanians in Southeast Europe. Not a citizen, Okay, but, uh, and I became a human rights activist when I got to Congress because people, Albanians from Kosovo, discovered that my father, a year before he died, in 1985, he died the following year, he was speaking Albanian, although my father was born in Italy, speaking Albanian to his younger sister, and they couldn't believe it. How was your father speaking Albanian? We thought you were Italian. Well, oh, I am Italian. Turns out, 600 years ago, when the Ottoman Turks overran Albania, tens of thousands of Albanians went to what was then the Kingdom of Naples, believe it or not. And today, they're still there speaking Albanian. So I ended up uh, with a mission to help the poor Albanians from Kosovo uh, get rid of a new age Hitler, that guy Milosevic. I went to The Hague, testified against them, we got him indicted, and as you probably remember, he died in jail, he didn't take his medicine. In any case, I am a CPA, and that's why I'm here. Yeah. You have a copy of my book, okay? It's very important that you, as young people, understand what's going on. They're playing a shell game today in Washington, you can't believe it. Social Security, we chapter five in my book. It's the biggest Ponzi scheme in the world. It's taking from one generation, giving to another. We had many politicians elected, lockbox, trust fund, don't believe it doesn't exist. There is a pencil entry, you know, about a Social Security Trust Fund. It was raised with a separate tax, FICA, supposed to be earmarked in a separate fund, but basically spent as fast as it came in. Why? And this is the problem with our, our, our whole budget system, because every Congress can change the budget to suit their needs. And what are the needs for politicians? Look at the White House. More concerned with being reelected in a second term than by then doing the right thing. He had the Simpson Bold Commission. Why didn't they make it mandatory? Or why didn't the President Obama say, that my commission, we should follow it? No. Because he didn't want to go first. But who went first? Congressman Ryan. You heard about him, right? Very brave thing he did. Raised the level of the debate. It's still not there. We still don't know what the right mix is. Short term or long term. But one thing I can tell you, most solutions, probably all solutions, are too short term because of the politics. So we have to make sure that you understand 
that the numbers that you're hearing are not the right numbers. What are you hearing these days? 14.3 trillion, what is that? That is the debt that is bonded, treasury bills, treasury notes, savings bonds, and not all of that is held in the public. About 40% of it is now in the Social Security Trust Fund and some in the Medicare Trust Fund. Why? They remove the money and put an IOU in there. We don't pay that interest out currently, but we accrue it. And it gets paid out when people get their benefit checks. I don't want to make this too, you know, one-on-one -on -one accounting for you, but you have to understand what's going on. But going back to what I said, and that's why the book is important, because it reviews the history of the budget process. Guess what happened in 1968? Lyndon Baines Johnson, in order to disguise the cost of a very unpopular war, Vietnam, came up with something called the Unified Budget. Sounds very nice. But guess what he did with that? He then took the surpluses of Social Security and reduced the deficits in those years, and it's been happening for the last 40 plus years. So every time you get a deficit, it's already been reduced by the annual surplus. In other words, what Social Security collected through FICA taxes, more than it paid out that year, that's what was used to reduce the deficit. So if you try to add up all the deficits, you will never get the bonded debt because it doesn't add up to that. It should. So you've got now that little trick that was played. But there are many other tricks. And one other is that we're not using the accounting system that the Security and Exchange Commission imposes on publicly traded companies. Why? To protect shareholders, protect their assets. What system are they using in the budget process? The cash basis. The cash basis, all that tells you is how cash is moving. And if I want to play games with it, it's easy. I defer writing a check, or I defer a payroll. One year, I remember, to balance the books or to make it look better, they had 53 weeks of the military payroll instead of 52. If you play that game forever, you, you, you just are dealing with nonsense. So that's another issue that we have to deal with. We have to get generally accepted accounting principles used in the budget process so that we know what it is that we're spending. Because what we're spending is not just writing checks. We are committing. Now, there's an article that I wrote, and I want you to see it, because the debt has been estimated by many people to be well over $60 trillion. But you know, you don't have to guess at this. Why? There's a financial statement that's published by the Treasury Department at the end of every year. It's called the Consolidated Financial Statements of the United States of America. My firm, Arthur Anderson, I left from an accounting firm after 22 years, 1984, prepared that as a gift to the people, a prototype. It was then picked up by the Treasury. Guess what the first thing the Treasury Department did in 1982 when they picked up this statement to hand it out? They took the liability for Social Security off the balance sheet and put it in a footnote. They didn't want you to know how much debt we have. But, you know, as I say in here, just like Osama bin Laden was hiding in plain sight in Pakistan, the numbers are hiding in plain sight. All you have to do is follow what I say here. Go on the Treasury Department's website to the publications and go get the annual statement for the fiscal year September 30th, 2010. Our fiscal year is ending pretty soon. But 2010, and go to the footnotes, and guess what you find? I'll put my glasses on and pick it up so you can see exactly the numbers. The first big number that you have is publicly held and intragovernmental debt represented by treasury bills. There's your 14.3 trillion today. That's going to be 15 trillion by the end of this fiscal year. It's about 14.3 and over right now. But look at the next line, Medicare. Parts A, B, and D for drugs. 22 trillion, 813. That's what actuaries compute. These are not numbers you pull out of thin air. If you're a publicly traded corporation like General Motors, 
you need to bring in an actuary to determine your liability for pensions, for the future, for people who are retired, still alive, people who are working, that got vested. Well, the same should be done for the obligations of the United States of America. And that number, 22 trillion, 813, believe it or not, the year before was another, and I have a little asterisk there. Was it, how much larger is it? Where's that asterisk? It's right here someplace. Yeah. This number was actually 15 trillion greater in 2009. Why? Because for 2010, the Treasury decided to take the benefit of Obamacare. And nobody has proven that those benefits are going to come true. So really, the debt is not 51 trillion, as I say here. It's probably 51 trillion plus at least another 10 trillion, over 60. But look at Social Security. This is the money that we owe people who are alive today, who are entitled to the benefits, and it's got to be paid out in the future. These are present value numbers, by the way. That's another $8 trillion. And then what else do you have? Civil service pensions, military pensions. They're not funded. That has to be paid out. Now, if you really want to know the debts of the United States of America, you've got to add the bonded debt, treasury bills, etc., and this debt, and you get to over $60 trillion. Now, that's going to be your burden in the future. Unless somebody is going to say we're going to renege on Social Security or we're going to you know, not give Medicare, your generation is going to have to deal with this. What I'm trying to do is get it on the books so we can understand the real dimension of the problem. If you don't know where you are, you cannot plan for the future. China is planning every day. They get a lot of interest from us. At the end of this fiscal year, what, they have right now, I think, a trillion dollars worth of our treasury bills, but that doesn't include Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac that they bought because we insisted on that as well. And a large part of our interest bill, and by the way, our interest bill this year is going to be somewhere between 200 billion and 300 billion, which is low. Why is it low? because the Federal Reserve have kept short-term interest rates pretty much down to zero. 10-year bonds are 3%, 30-year bonds are not much more, maybe 4%. But we have built up a tremendous inclination now for inflation. The Fed has run out of options. They had their quantitative easing number two. I don't think they're going to have another quantitative easing. They've got a balance sheet of $3 trillion. That means they printed that money. It's out there. Don't you think interest rates are going to go up? God forbid we go back to the Carter days where they had a stagflation. You remember what that is? Stagnant economy with inflation. Are we heading there? Our economy hasn't taken off, as you know. Look at the job market. So interest rates will go up. What's the danger with the national debt? The danger is that we could easily go six, seven, eight, nine percent in the next five years. Under Jimmy Carter, the prime rate was 21 percent. Could you believe that? You're too young to remember. But I had a mortgage on a piece of property in Ready, Connecticut, and I was paying 18 percent for at least one year. So I'm telling you that these are practical things you have to understand. What you're hearing today on Capitol Hill is the political debate. And it's likely they're going to end up with another short-term solution. But as I say in my article here, no matter what they do, and I believe they will raise the debt ceiling, but they're not going to do the job to bend the curve on the national debt the way they should. And as I said in this article, raising the debt ceiling does not solve the fiscal crisis because our national debt is a ticking time bomb. All it does, raising the debt ceiling, is reset the clock on the bomb. Our big competition today is China. China is preparing for the future. They get a lot of money from us. Obviously, they lend us money, but we have to pay them back interest. Our deficit we trade with them is at least $300 billion, and that's sucking up jobs from America. But look what China's doing. They're going around Africa, less developed countries, making loans. Why? They're locking up the rare earths. They're locking up all the minerals they need for their space age industries, for their aviation industries. Look at their infrastructure. They're putting up big dams. They're building roads. Well, they have to because they're starting from a low base. 
I have a bridge in my district, the Tappan Zee Bridge. 160,000 cars and trucks come across that bridge every day. It's 10 years over its useful life. No one can seem to come to grips with the fact we've got to change, we've got to build a new bridge and probably include other transportation modes on it, like buses and trains and freight. But guess what they want to do again? Put another $200 million into the road bed when the bridge is already obsolete. There was a bridge, I ran for the US Senate and I visited Lake Champlain up there. There was a bridge that got so unsafe, they just had to blow it up. And people could not get to their jobs. They had to wait until they got a ferry service. They didn't even plan for it. So this is the condition of infrastructure in New York, and I dare say it's probably the condition of infrastructure in America. And what is the issue with infrastructure? Infrastructure is good. It's an asset. It creates economic fluidity. This is the time to build. Why? Interest rates are low. You can borrow 10 years at 3%, 30 years at 4%, maybe a little bit more. And yet economists say that infrastructure, well done, well located, gives you 15 to 20% economic benefits. But what else does it do? It puts people to work immediately. This is where Obama did not do the job. The bailout was not what we needed. We needed a massive infrastructure plan to put people to work. Now, why would you think they didn't do that? Well, one of the problems with the bookkeeping system is, and you'll see it at the bottom of my article, because I was the chairman of a task force to change the budget process. That task force was set up by the Association of Government Accountants in 1992. And one of our recommendations was, we need a capital budget. What does that mean? Well, we spent last year, or this year we're going to spend, at the end of the fiscal year, $3.7 trillion. Over $500 billion of that is assets. And yet it gets put into the deficit. Like anything else, like an operating expense. That's not right. That should be recorded as an asset. And then people wouldn't say, well, we're raising the debt needlessly. No, that debt, if we have to borrow, and I hope we don't have to, because I think many of these infrastructure projects could be private-public partnerships, where the tolls would be able to pay the bonds. That's what we should have. But we do need infrastructure, and we need to change the budget process so that we don't put in the deficit what we're spending on assets. For instance, we had an aircraft carrier last year. It cost a billion dollars. It's in the deficit. Now, at the end of the year, when they do that statement with the Treasury Department, they try to reclassify some of these things, but that's not the way it should be done in the budget process. What else is wrong with the budget process? It is one big omelet that's scrambled. What do I mean by that? The budget includes the trust funds, government-sponsored enterprises like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, Resolution Trust Company, the Post Office, and 20 others. Most of them losing money, but they can sell bonds with the full faith and credit of the United States of America. So their losses are mixed in there somewhere. Plus you have your operating accounts. This is not right. They're not equivalent economically. We should have a separate budget for trust funds, a separate budget for government-sponsored enterprises, and a separate budget for everything else but then you divide that everything else into capital items and regular. And then you have the accounting system that the Securities and Exchange Commission mandates on publicly traded companies. And guess what happens if you don't use that system? You're indicted for securities fraud. You go to jail. But Congress exempted themselves and the government from these rules. When you read my book, I think it's uh, page 74, you'll see all the laws that Congress exempted themselves from. Do as I say, not as I do. House, and I, and that chapter I think I named House of Ill Repute. In fact, I wrote a book uh, with some conservatives back in 1986, and we put the Capitol on the cover. We named it House of Ill Repute. I did the chapter on the, uh, the budget, and guess what I put at the top of the U.S. Capitol? A red light. I took the, cap, the Statue of Freedom off, and I said, this is a House of Ill Repute. The ethics violations, at that time, the Democrats controlled the whole thing, so we had an incentive to kind of expose it. So we need to know where we are in order to know where we're going. If we don't change, 
the curve of the national debt. Even the Obama administration has said that our national debt will be $20 trillion, the bond debt, by 2017. Imagine if then interest rates go up, let's say 5%. What's 5% of 20 trillion? That's a trillion dollars of interest. Right now we're already, and that's only five years from now, a little more than five years. That's gonna suck up a lot of money away from things that we need, like national security. Now we got problems with two wars, you're right. We had problems under Bush, two wars off the books, that was wrong. They did not set a good example in that Republican administration by what they did on the accounting for those wars. That's, we got to call it for what it is, no matter what party we're talking about. And by the way, I think it's time, while we are proud to say we're Republicans, there's a party you've got to put above that. It's called America. We have divided our system into so many factions. Even the Republicans now, look at the House. You got the Tea Party, you got the others. Are we going to come up with a long-term solution for America that allows us to compete against China? China knows where it's going. Their growth this year, and they're trying to reduce it because of inflation, is over 8%. Ours was just reduced from 3%, our estimate, down to 2.4. Now, we're still the biggest economy in the world. Let me give you some numbers. I just spoke at uh, Dalhousie University up in Halifax. And since there were 50 people talking about international economics, I had to make a global perspective. So I went to school a little bit. Guess what the GDP of the world is? Anybody know? It's $60 trillion. The sum total of all of your goods and services and the sum total of you know, services and whatnot. Guess what the United States is? You know, 15 trillion. So we are one quarter of the world. But that 15 trillion now is almost exactly equal to the bonded debt. So we've got now 100% of our GDP in bonded debt. But if you added all the debt, the 60 trillion, we have four times the gross domestic product of the United States of America. And we're worried about Greece that has 150%. And don't forget, there's another ticking time bomb, and it's called Greece. They didn't solve that problem. As someone said, they put lipstick on a pig. It's going to go down. There's no question about it. They're in default. They're trying not to call it a default because they know it's going to have other ramifications. Now we find out that Italy has a problem. We know Ireland has a problem. Iceland had a problem. Portugal and Spain are in trouble. We don't know where the Eurozone is going. And we're not much better. The only thing that keeps us much better is that we got the safest place for money in the world is called treasury bills right now, even though there's no interest paid. So, okay, I got five minutes to wrap up? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So let me conclude by saying you have an immense responsibility to understand what's really going on. I set up a foundation, Truth in Government, when I left Congress, and I go around speaking. I raise enough money, I don't get paid to do that, to get these books reprinted. And this is a new edition of the book I did in 1992, so I can hand it out, especially to younger people like yourself. That's why I was so happy that they found a place for me at the conference. A week ago, I didn't know I was going to speak here. But when I figured, when, when someone said, you know, you could do it, I decided I was going to drive down, and I had my college intern with me, Michael Boney. He's, he's got me, when I ran for the Senate, this young man was in the car, and He's very good with social media. Uh, every time we left a place in New York, let's say Lake Placid, I just left this beautiful place. Or double Cooperstown, the baseball, and he put up a twit pick. So I ended up with how many twit fans? 15,000 fans on Facebook. How many? 15,000. 15,000. How many on Twitter? About 2,000 or so. Okay, so I started, you know, I don't think anybody did that in New York State. So it's important to get the message across, and it's important that you understand you have now a moral obligation to understand this issue and to speak about it and get involved. Because if you get involved, then you're going to be part of the solution, not the problem. So fill out that form, the Truth in Government form. I'm going to be outside to sign the book. Here's my good friend, Dick Morris. Dick, how are you doing? 
This man was on my side right at the end, and that center was right here. Amazing. And by the way, you know, the, the funniest thing, I was on Sean and Hannity's show a few times since then, and he says, when are you going to get your daughter Kara on my show? I said, wait a minute, she doesn't want to be branded about politics. I don't want it to be about politics. I love music. I love your daughter. I said, well, if you can guarantee me and her that you won't start asking her political questions, I'll get her on. Well, that happened. She was on about, I think, a month ago, and I made him very happy. So he owes me. Maybe I'm going to go back on again. We'll see. In any case, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, read the book. Uh, again, I'm going to repeat. When they set the new debt ceiling, it's going to happen, but it's not going to be the right formula. If anything, you know, from experience we know is that it's going to be a short-term thing that's just going to get us past the crisis. No, we've got to bend that curve down. But all they're doing by raising that debt ceiling is raising the debt ceiling so that the bond markets don't get too volatile, they're not solving the fiscal crisis. Our national debt is a ticking time bomb, and all they're doing is resetting the clock. And that clock works against you as young people. Get them to put on the books what they're really committed, not just the current spending on a cash basis, so you know where we stand, so you can know how to plan for the future with your family in this great country. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here.